because of the pandemic. Back in, I think, June or May, the um, governor extended the open meeting law request of being in a public place. We can do it via team Zoom, um, which is what you guys have decided to do. Currently, I have uh, Tom Fickner, Andy Fisk, and Tom Ryder on the call right now. So um, with that, I would say, Andy, I would turn it over to you. Uh, I know you want to discuss first uh, the ongoing issues at 106 Millville Street, which is something that unexpectedly came up. Um, so I'll leave it off to you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Tom Ryder, are you by any chance up to date on what happened yesterday? Uh, yeah, Miss Missy uh, uh, got me up to speed on 106 Millville. Uh, okay. so I don't know the, the whole situation. I know that uh, that there uh, that there may be a, um, a food <laughs> operation, restaurant, or something like that. Yeah, I'll get to that, please. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to see. Uh, we um, someone else joining? Um, Alan, I believe is on. Alan, is that you? That's me. Okay. Everybody's here. Plus, uh, three board members are here, and Tom Ryder is here. Go ahead, Andy. Thank you. Danielle will, Danielle join, will us. join us. She said she would be a little bit late. Be a little bit late. I don't know what's going on, what's but I'm going on, on, but I'm talking my food. Cannot do it this Cannot way. Cannot do it this way. I'm going to hang up and call back. Oh, it didn't happen okay. that time. Wait a minute. It went away. Okay, sorry. That was okay, very sorry. that was very confusing. Oh. It's back. It again. Could you hear it? Yeah, I yeah. can hear you. Like echoey. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. Okay. Um, so last Friday, Mitzi got contacted by Michael Cahill from the state that there was a an alleged illegal slaughterhouse and kitchen at 106 Millville Road, which I guess is now called Millville Street. And I actually, the reason for my saying that is because it's important that we, if in fact this is true, and I, I asked some of the cops and I don't have a, a straight answer just yet, because Menden now has a new dispatch, and I'm getting a little sidetracked and I'll get to the point in a minute. Menden has a new dispatch. It is no, no longer down, downtown. It is in the town of Norfolk, and um, oh my God. I had an issue with um, trying to identify where the situation, I, I was calling to get the police department to get an assistance of an officer, and I had a hard time with them understanding where I was looking for an address. So. It's important that I was saying Millville Road, apparently it's Millville Street, and we got that straightened out. I did get the assistance of an officer. When I got there, there was two officers that followed me in. Danielle was on scene. We went to the door. I spoke with a man. I, I don't know his name, unfortunately. He was Brazilian. His son, I think they were calling him Kevin, was translating for us. And I asked him for permission to walk the property, told him who we were, why we were there. Danielle gave him a card. I gave him one of my cards and he gave us permission to walk the property. We did walk through all the buildings and we witnessed in the lower riding stable, which was built to, um, it's a sand floor, very large open space garage uh, type uh, building. It's a, it's for ri a riding stable had numerous um, tables and chairs set up like a restaurant type thing with an, an, a bunch of tables put together like a counter. There are um, probably 20 to 30 dozen of eggs all in, in do one dozen boxes. Um, there was some uh, long stem cane there, which I don't know what they use that for. Uh, there were some other food items on the tables and on the walls, were menus with prices on them. I have pictures of all of that. Um, 
in, in, in discussion with him, he said, yes, they, they do entertain there, but he said they don't sell, which was a lie because there was at least three different walls that had the menus on them with the prices. Um, there was a an event there. One of the officers spoke with one of the neighbors, and there was an event there recently um, at this at 106 Millville Street. And the neighbor had walked over there during the middle of the event, and he said it was like a farmer's market. There was all kinds of food on the tables, and money was exchanging hands. It's very dirty. There was feces on the floor from the animals, a lot of animal tracks. They walked through this room um, often, currently, you know, very often. Um, also, at that point, um, ACO Sullivan showed up, and when I asked one of the officers why he was there, he said that Chief Kersey had asked him to join us. So immediately, uh, Kevin was appalled by everything that we were witnessing. There was, in one pen, there was probably close to 300 uh, ducks, geese, uh, sheep, goats, alpaca, uh, uh, chickens of all sorts. And there were dead chickens in the pen. It's a relatively good size pen, but there was minimal water, no fresh water, very, very mud, uh, muddy, dirty water, no visible signs of fresh food. There was um, old corn husks, corn ears on the ground that everybody was picking at, but they were all brown and dried up, and it was it was not pretty. Further investigation in the upper barn, we found stalls with probably around 30 animals there, horses, ponies. Two, one stall had two dogs in it with no collars. One stall had pigs in, in uh, slop. It was gross. Um, another, there was some chickens. There was numerous animals, and not one of the stalls had water in any of the buckets. Um, it, it, they were they were very very minimal. No food, no fresh food, no hay in any of them. There was only two bales of hay at the beginning of part of the barn. Uh, that's all he had for fresh food. Kevin called um, Michael Cahill, left a message. Kevin called um, Tufts Veterinary Services. Kevin called Mass Equine, and he also called. Um, uh, ASPCA. Everyone did show up, and there was an, uh, a cow, a calf in the pen that was extremely ill. It had tags on its ears. When I asked him where he bought it, he said Littleton Auction. It, it's been there about 60 days. This cow was very, very weak and actually toppled over while we were sitting, standing there talking. Um, at that point, um, Tufts Veterinary Services was there she and Peter Hawks from, from Hawks's farm went into the pen and uh, sat the, the animal back up. It was very, very ill. The, the, um, the vet did start administering um, antibiotics and, and meds to rehydrate this poor thing because its, its bones, its spine, it was very emaciated. The spine, it was, it was not pretty. Um, we ended up the... Uh, ASPCA, her name is Nadia, she may, st spoke with the, the owner of the property and expressed that this animal needed to be euthanized. They felt at this point that they would like, they being ASPCA and vets, uh, Tufts vets, would like to take the, um, the opportunity to try and save this animal. But if they did that, they would take ownership of that animal. And he agreed to that. So we transported the, the calf to a stall in the upper barn, and, and they proceeded to give it meds. And I brought it water, and, and there was food and everything. And I don't know what the outcome was today. I do know the police department was back there today. The SPCA was back there today. Um, there was some goats that were um, in trouble. They were also confiscated. They were uh, two 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 day old babies that were extremely weak. Mother was dried up, no grain for her. Uh, it was, it was uh, a sad situation. They, they took them 
I hope they made it through the night um, and much longer. In conversation with um, Detective Erskine this morning, he called me and asked me what our take was on everything that happened yesterday. And I, I told him how what we responded to the call for the um, possibility of the alleged illegal slaughterhouse in the kitchen. And in walking, he and I walked, and um, some of the other officers walked the entire property, and nowhere did we witness, actually, Tom Fickner walked with us. We, we Nowhere did we see any, um, no, no signs of any kind of a, a slaughterhouse operation. No, nothing that would make us believe that. But there was the restaurant. And we told them, and Danielle, our health inspector, she walked it with us too. She uh, very uh, strongly and explicitly told them, no more. This is closed. You cannot do this. Explain to them why we, Tom Fickner explained to them why we were there and what this was about. And, and there is, you know, you need to, the process that they need to, if they do in fact want to go forward with some kind of a, a farm store or, or something like that, they need to come forward and start the process. There is a whole process to the whole thing. Um, in conversation with Nick Erskine this morning, he asked us what our take was on closing this facility. And I told him that it, it is only my opinion. We are a three person board and it's not my decision, but I don't know, first of all, if in fact we have the, the right to close that business, but that's not what I want to do. The man is from Brazil and he obviously uh, wants to be a farmer. That's probably the life he led over there. And he has a passion for the farming thing, you know, the, but he needs to, this isn't Brazil, this is America. And it, we do things different here. And the, the, the entire place needs to be cleaned up and give him some guidance and some help to give him the opportunity to possibly turn this situation around and have a clean, healthy farm where the animals are very well taken care of as opposed to what we witnessed yesterday. Uh, at that point, uh, Mr. Erskine told me that he thinks, he believes that the courts are going to take action um, regardless of what we may or may not do. And he said, I don't feel that they're going to give him the opportunity to carry on, which in my opinion, as, as much as it was very saddening yesterday for everything that we all witnessed, um, I think that that's, that's a sad situation also, but that's just my opinion. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, Max Carboni did join us. Max is our animal control, uh, no, yeah, our um, animal inspector, and he does the barn books. Max is very knowledgeable and walked through the barns and described everything that he saw, and he will be coming forthcoming with reports about his opinion of what he saw and, and everything that he witnessed. Um, Max also sent me numerous texts with pictures of a business page on Facebook that this man they call Cowboy, I don't even know his whole real name, he is, is, has been running this um, restaurant type service for a long time he comes from Tingsboro, and he suggested that possibly we reach out to Tingsboro Board of Health to see if maybe they have had any issues with this gentleman over the years. Uh, I don't know if that was done today or not. Um, I think that's about it for right now. I'm sure I'll think of something else as we go on. Tom Fickner, you were there. Could you chime in, please? I think I put him to sleep. <laughs> He's unmuted, so. Holy cow, when nobody answered, I said, don't tell me I spoke all that for nothing because my phone died. <laughs> no, no, all no, right. no. But I, I did want to let you know I got an email from um, Danielle. Well. She, Danielle, she's not going to be able to make it tonight. Okay. So um, I don't know if you guys want to have 
a meeting next week. I, I, it's totally up to you. Okay, um, we'll, we'll get to that. Yep. Alan, Alan, would you do? Uh, I know you you had other um, commitments. I appreciate you coming there to to show up, and and um, it's all good. What do you think about all what I just said? Um, I'm in uh, total agreement, and I thought you did a, a very good job describing the situation. Um, I didn't witness everything, um, but my girls at one point did ride their horses in that riding ring uh, with the sand floor, and I was very uh, very surprised to see what was going on there. Um, I don't know what is customary in uh, Brazil or whatever country this gentleman, you know, may have grown up in. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, it was an unfortunate sight. The animals were pretty much being housed in what was formerly the manure pit, um, which periodically uh, Peter Hawks would come and clean out. And uh, as you can see from the mound there that is no longer manure, um, that's kind of a shame that that's where those animals were living. Um, and uh, I want to say that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, Missy and uh, everybody followed through with this um, because uh, if, if we, we hadn't, we uh, would have uh, missed an opportunity to uh, turn this around. And like you said, you know, maybe the gentleman will have an opportunity to, uh, do something in in some fashion the right way. Um, I did ask Missy when she first brought this to my attention. Um, I'm under the assumption that a gentleman from Watertown actually owns the property, and this gentleman is a tenant. So please uh, correct me. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Missy. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, the, the property owner is um, a resident from Watertown, um, so that is correct, and this gentleman is leasing the property. I believe Tom Fickner has called in. He was having trouble. He told me he was going to call in, so Tom, I'm assuming that's you. That is me. Can you hear me okay? Yep. We can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Before I go back to you, Tom, Missy, has, uh, what is the gentleman's name in Watertown? His name is Zhao, J-O-A-O, -O, Neto, N-E-T-O, and he's from Watertown, Mass. He also owns another property in town also. Could you please respell that? Uh, I didn't have a pen in hand. I'm sorry. J -O. Sure. So his first name is J-O-A-O, and the last name is N-E-T-O. Okay, that name sounds familiar. I wonder where I've run into that. He Has actually, he been notified? Of, good. He actually owns 9 Main Street also. 9 Main. Which one's that? It's the one that's um, off his, uh, the, um, on the other side of the church. Is that the one we're testing? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, that might be why I remember it. Has he been notified of this situation? Do you know, Missy? Not that I know of, no. Okay, I'll reach out to De Detective Erskine and uh, fill him in so he can follow up on that. Um, Tom Ryder, I've got a question for you. Uh, first of all, before I go to you, please, Tom Fickner, did you hear my whole run-on spiel? I did. Yeah. I, you know, you summarized it um, very well. It was uh, unfortunately a sad, you know, sad situation with what's going on out there. Um, they, I know in having some brief communications with um, the, the two gentlemen there, I think one actually might have been the, the son of the other gentleman, I believe, right? The one yes, I think his name was Kevin. Kevin or Brian. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that might be right. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he did, uh, the gentleman mentioned uh, who wasn't able to communicate well with the English had mentioned that um, he had been operating a restaurant. Um, actually, you should show me a business card with that cowboy reference. 
on at Cowboy Cafe up in uh, Lowell, I believe, for a few years. Tingsboro. And then, oh, the Tingsboro, okay. So, um, you know, that had been a venture that he had been involved with. Um, but they did mention that, you know, he does apparently have a farming background, that he did quite a bit of that in Brazil prior to coming here, and I, I guess was looking to kind of implement uh, or re, um, redo that farming uh, here, uh, you know, in the United States at this particular location. But I think, unfortunately, given the state of the, the animals and the situation, I think, you know, before he'd be able to do that, um, whether or not he'll get the opportunity to correct the situation without actually being completely shut down. Um, you know, I hope maybe we could at least give him an opportunity to correct all that's kind of not right. Um, I, I did, uh, in, in conversation, um, the, I don't know if the communication or language barrier plays into part of this uh, situation and having them being able to understand uh, what was needed. And I don't know to what extent they actually reached out um, to determine what was needed. Um, we did have a conversation about licensing and there was some reference to um, them initially doing a reach out uh, to the town about that. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know to what extent or what information they were given or, you know, to work with. But um, go ahead. I believe, excuse me one second. He said that he went to the town hall three times and could get nowhere. I, I really don't believe that because had they gone there, and supposedly Brian went with them, had they gone there, they would have been redirected to the Board of Health office. So that's why, because I asked them, did they talk to someone? And they said yes. And I said, did they direct you to the Board of Health? No. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't throw a lot of credence onto that one. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, uh, like I said, it's a sad situation. Um, and again, the question will be to, based on the seriousness of the conditions, how, what will the allowance be for them to move forward to potentially correct it, you know, and not correct it. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I had mentioned to the, the gentleman there, um, and really it was kind of the only reference I had made as to why we were there. I, I sent in my, um, statement around the concern for the animals, you know, the animals well-being. Um, I hadn't specifically mentioned any of the other uh, issues uh, that were presented to us as possibilities for what might have been going on, you know, as I didn't fully know them myself. So I left it basically that the, you know, the core, um, the core element, the core reason we were there was simply to uh, determine if the animals are being kept safely, uh, healthy. And so from that perspective, I don't know if anything more might have been said to them on the departure part of it um, in summary, but um, that was uh, that's how I presented it. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Did you hear the part of my statement where I, um, Detective Erskine, when he asked me about well, how we felt about closing them down. And I told him about uh, hoping to, to help them to get corrected. And we may not have the opportunity. The courts may take action. Did you hear that? I did, yes. And so, you know, it may be out of our hands. I, I you know, if they were willing and able to correct the situation and, and take, you know, take immediate action, uh, you know, I've always kind of liked to give an opportunity. Um, but yeah. If they're not able to, and um, then, you know, we'd have to have them cease and desist, you know, for the sake of the animal's well-being, you know. Okay. So that segues into my next question to Tom Ryder. When uh, uh, Detective Erskine asked me about the Board of Health's stance on closing that place, my response was, I really don't know if, in fact, if it was not a, um, if it is basically about the animals' well, welfare and, and cleanliness and, and well-being, and there is not an impact on the people, the residents, and the neighbors, do we have jurisdiction where we can do anything like that? 
Not that we want to, obviously, but would that be come under our realm? For for um, for closing of of the food establishment or the uh, their um, no, the, the whole farm. The whole farm. Yeah. Um, if they are if they if they are uh, serving food, handling food, and serving it to the general public, it doesn't matter if it's for free or for 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 pricing. Uh, they they need a, the the board of health per, permission and need a permit and they need to to be uh, they need a, a food handler's um, license. Sure, sure. That's that's um, that part of it. We we I think we all understand there. But my question was about the animals and the farm. And the animals. Do we have. Any, yeah, do we have any jurisdiction if it was not corrected? And it was an imp it was not an impact on residents of the of the property or the neighbors, uh, the water, the, the anything like that. Would would we have any any uh, if if it was just the animals and the animals' uh, health and welfare? Um, it, it might be a there might be a federal um, enforcement too, uh, as far as like USDA um, or or you know depends on what they're using the animals for. Um, so as far as, um, you know, I've seen uh, boards of health come in and, and shut down puppy mills and things like that. Uh, so if it's very similar where they're um, not taking care of the animals, uh, but that's why we have the uh, animal inspector. Um, it, did he commit to um, enforcing anything uh, in regards to how the animals are being treated as far as uh, the cleanliness of the place and the breeding of uh, vectors and, uh, and diseases and stuff. At uh, that point last night, um, it was conveyed to me that uh, Mike Cap, um, it is going on. Uh, Michael Cahill from the state had uh, said to Missy before we took any action, the state is taking point on this. And, and after what happened yesterday, there was some, I don't want to say gung ho, but there was some pretty upset people that wanted to um, file charges. And I told Max and I told Kevin before you met, file any charges, I can't tell the police because that's totally different. I told them before you take file any charges, please have a conversation with uh, Mike Cahill prior to taking any action. Certainly you can fill him in on what we witnessed, what we saw, but please have a conversation with him because he specifically asked us that the, the state was going to take point. So as far as any uh, charges coming from ACO Sullivan or um, Animal Inspector Max, I don't know if they, I, they promised me that they would do that. I, I, I think that's a good idea to keep the Board of Health and Communication and, and also uh, uh, and also, kind of let us know, let us know what's going on, so so we can uh, at least uh, be able to talk, uh, explain to other board members or, or other departments, you know, what's what's going on appropriately and uh, in the general public, if asked. Um, but yeah, um, so as far as the board of health um, enforcing it, uh, I, I I do think that um, you know going through Mike and through the through the state, I think is probably the the appropriate way to have that enforced because um, I'm not sure if um, uh, they, they may have uh, they may have the codes that they are going to cite uh, directly. It, it may be a federal it may be a federal um, enforcement as well. Uh, it depends if it's if they are using it as a slaughterhouse. That is uh, definitely USDA. Uh, yeah, there was there was no signs whatsoever as being a slaughterhouse. Okay. Okay. AJ? Uh, well, one thing I just want to just comment on that, if I could briefly. Sure. Uh, just going by what um, was in the email that came from um, Mike Cahill uh, <clears throat> when he stated that um, when they had done their inspection, it was with uh, USDA investigators. And he mentioned two individuals that accompanied Mike on that inspection. Um, the actual statement from Mike was that. Um, there was some indication um, 
do about the uh, accusation of the slaughterhouse, but um, he says, however, there was no concrete evidence to substantiate that, but there was something that you know, they were picking up on, but not enough to substantiate, uh, I guess, an actual charge or determination that it was actually a slaughterhouse. Thank sure, you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Thank you. When when you and I walked around there, I, what I was looking for was you know the usual signs that you could expect, blood, feathers, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and I saw nothing anywhere that we went. So that, that uh, I won't say it didn't happen. I didn't see anything while we were there. Okay. AJ, if um, I may. Of course you may. Um, just, just for the record, um, so that we don't blur what, what happened there. Um, I believe that we were, were responding to uh, the possibility of an illegal restaurant and illegal slaughterhouse, which we just talked about. The uh, animals we sort of witnessed um, as a result of that inspection that we were going to, to check out, um, which as you mentioned, the state was already in the process of uh, acting on. So I just want to make sure that for our, for our records, um, that it, it's noted correctly that as to what we were responding to. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. The, the way that that all came about with all the entities that came there to do their investigations was when Chief Kersey asked ACO Sullivan to join us at that property, which was unbeknownst to me until he pulled up. When Kevin got there, he was appalled at what he saw and immediately picked up his phone when he saw dead animals, sick animals, and started calling. And that's his job. So he, he was very, very upset uh, up until the wee hours of this morning. I left there at almost 10 o'clock last night. And at one o'clock this morning, he put a post on Facebook. So he was still out there and he's, he's quite upset. So that's how all the animal inspectors and uh, had the powers to be, whoever they were, vets and, and uh, SPCA, that's how they got involved. That was above and beyond us. So we did our part and, and we conveyed no more kitchen, no, no more. And he said he understood. So we did it. That's why we were there. And I stayed because we instilled the, the start of this yesterday afternoon. So I stayed as long as I could. Um, and it was, well, it was winding down when I left, but uh, that was, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, Alan. Well, you know, thank you very much. I, I appreciate all the time and effort that everybody put into it and apologize that I had to return to my job. Um, one other thing, um, if this gentleman is leasing the property from the owner who lives in Watertown, how do the people that are living upstairs in the old uh, broodmare barn, how do they play in and are the conditions up there acceptable? Back to you, Mr. Chairman. That, that opens a whole nother door. In walking around and, and checking every inch of the site, uh, with the officers and Danielle, in the upstairs of the upper barn above the stalls, we saw two rooms with mattresses on the floor and pillows and bed li linens. They were being used regularly and recent. So I asked Danielle, and Danielle is a housing, uh, she does do housing also. So that, that opens a whole nother chapter. And also while while I'm thinking of it, Missy went and spoke with uh, Ellen today and found out that there are, in fact, two families um, living at this property. And I remember, I don't remember if you were on the board at the time, Ellen, I, I don't remember. Um, do you remember when Shea Engineering came in when the man wanted to sell the property and there was an issue with the septic system? Uh, I don't believe it was a deed restriction but there was a limitation put on because of the septic system that was there 
It was allowed to be able to do a Title V and sell as is, but there was a limitation as to how many people could stay there. Do you remember any of that, Alan? Uh, yes, I do. I was uh, present at the meeting when the husband and wife that were trying to sell the property at the time came in. That's right, too, because you had mentioned that you're familiar with the property because of your association with the animals and your, and your daughters. Missy, what did you find out when you looked up that address and for septic? Hold on a minute and I'll pull it up for you and I'll let you know when I have it. Hold on. Okay, let me go to Tom Ryder. Did you pull your notes up on this property? Yeah, I, I have some notes on it uh, dating back um, 2017, maybe 2016. Um, so there was a Title V inspection. Um, and I think they're missed, uh, they were missing a few pieces of information. I think we sent out an enforcement letter and um uh, Shay Engineer uh in Darling uh, were involved. Darling uh 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 what are they uh in septic inspector yeah, yeah pumper yeah um so they did a um like a further evaluation letter I think um so, um, and subsequently they did well testing and I think we concurred that it was a two bedroom st uh, structure. So they had one two bedroom, I think eventually. You know, I, I'm probably missing a few pieces of information, um, but you know, ultimately um, they, they complied with, a, with a, some of the information that we were requesting. Um, there was no deed restriction put on there, was there? No, no, we didn't do, there was no deed restriction, but it was like an old system that was designed for two bedrooms or, uh, I mean, it's very small. Uh, Wasn't there a problem with the distance to the well? Um, so I'm pulling up my notes here. Um, Oh, hold on. Taking a while here. So, so, um, okay, while you're doing that, Missy, do you have your notes up? Yeah, it was yep. less than 100, but more than 50 feet. Yep, sorry about that. Yep. That's Yep. So I actually I pulled up. I have the letter up from Tom back in June of 2017. Um, basically, like what the the findings were. Um, the le the well was less than 100 feet. Um, that there was retest. Blah blah blah. And that the the system is designed for a two bedroom facility um, and not for anything more. The other thing too is I talk to, cause I always go to the assessor's office to um, pull up the field card to make sure I have the proper owner. And Jean told me that in FY13, 106 and 108 were combined as one lot, which has a house on it. And the house is in, according to the assessor's records, for FY13, house is in tear down condition. So Jean also said well, you might want to see what's going on with that house, make sure no one's living in there. But so now you have to have a septic system that will not only designed for this barn, but there's a dilapidated house now part of this property too. Tom Fickner and I walked over there along with a couple of the offices last night and we did not see any clearly visible signs. We didn't walk around the upper part of the house. We walked around from the barn over there. I did not see any visible signs of occupation in that house, but there was an electric wire coming out of one of the windows and going down a stone wall. So I don't know if there is anybody in there definitively or not. Tom Fickner has, a, has his hand up, Andy. Speak. 
Well, I was actually just going to reference what you had just uh, spoken to, Andy, when we were taking a brief look at that structure um, that was adjacent to the barn. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is um, at that far end of that upper barn where the horses, ponies, and other animals were being housed, there was um, quite a bit of uh, uh, trash and uh, a scent, a bit of a stench that went along with that. Um, the various bags and whatnot that appear to have been out there um, probably, I think, for quite some time. So there's, a, there's an element of, uh, of that there in terms of uh, maybe from an environmental uh, health perspective that uh, uh, it would be a concern as well. Andy? Uh, yes, it, did, it was a stench, that's for sure. Tom Ryder, did you have anything more about the system? I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. I, went, I figured while you were looking, I was going to Missy. What did you say about the distance to the well? Yeah, it was. it's less than 100, but more than 50. And then, and I seem to recall also when, when Missy started bringing up the, the information about the teardown structure, I did remember that uh, that was... Uh, that was a part of the uh, discussion from back in 2017. So I'm going back four years, I do, I do recall that they were saying, yeah, that, that structure, people are not gonna live in it. Uh, it's, it's the two bedroom. Uh, that's where, um, that, that's what the system was for. Uh, and I think his name was uh, Mike, uh, Mike Murphy. I think he sold the property, I guess, to the, to the new person. Yes. Oh yeah, that's great, I forget that, yeah. Yeah. I have a friend named Mike Murphy. That's why I remember that name all of a sudden. Okay. So um, currently, with all that being said, like Alan stated, we were there for a kitchen suspicion of a um, slaughterhouse, which we did not see any telltale signs. I think that a um, a strongly written letter sent certified mail both to the property owner, Mr. Netto, and if we have an address, obviously it's 106, hopefully they'll be able to understand it. And I would think it should go certified mail signature required for a cease and desist on a kitchen. Um, I, how do you feel about that, Tom uh, Fickner? I'm sorry, I had to put the handset down for a second. Could you repeat the uh, repeat that question, Andy? Well, for starters, I think that as far as he says, he's not going to do the kitchen anymore. But I think that a strongly written um, letter with a cease and desist as far as the kitchen, it should be delivered both to the property owner, Mr. Netto, he, so he's informed of what's going on at his property, and the uh, this guy cowboy um, cease and desist registered mail signature required how do you feel uh, i would agree alan uh, i'm in agreement and i don't see why we can't uh, seek out somebody to uh, translate it into i'm assuming spanish and send it so that it can be read both in English and in Spanish. Just That's a thought. not a bad idea. Do you know someone that can do that with your daughters or anything? Uh, uh, no, I don't think my daughters are capable of doing that. Um, but I didn't know if maybe uh, we, we got the high school. We uh, give them a lot of taxpayer dollars. Maybe we could get someone from National Honor Society or something to help us out. Okay, Missy, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, first, Tom has his hand up, Tom Fickner. Well, just just, just to add what, to what uh, Alan said, uh, I think that's key in terms of the communication. And I, I, I think um, although um, this younger gentleman, Brian, may have some understanding of English, I think it's extremely important in this case that uh, communication that goes to them uh, in English, uh, for sure, but I think it also needs to be in their native language as well, so that there's no um, idea. no ifs, ands, or buts in terms of understanding uh, what what we're trying to to tell them. 
I think that's a great idea, Tom. Uh, who, who's going to Tom Fickner? Would this be a, a letter? And and it has to be expeditious. So it's got to come out like as soon as you can. If you, I know you're working a lot. Uh, would you be able to do something like that? I could. Yeah, I could put through a draft and then present it to the uh, rest of the board for uh, input. Sure. Okay. Uh, I know you're working a lot. Would it? Would you be able to do it sooner than later? I could, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Andy? Yes. <laughs> uh, two things. Um, I think you should have a written report um, from Danielle of all the violations she witnessed, so that way Tom can quote the correct, you know, codes or regulations. The other she thing was, huh? She did say she will do that. I'll text her right okay. now and ask her to get that over to you ASAP. Okay. Uh, number two, um, I did. I I've been talking with Lenny, and uh, he had made the suggestion that we ha either hire an interpreter or whatnot. And I said, well, how do you know that someone? I don't want to say as a licensed interpreter, but truly understands the language, you know, because I do know Spanish, but there's different types of Spanish and different dialect. So he said that Milford did have, a, a, I think it's Spanish and Portuguese um, interpreter, and that he would reach out to this person and see if they would be willing to work with Menden on this issue. Lenny's going to reach out to them for us? Yep. Okay. Thank you. That's that's a great idea. Thank you very much, Alan. No, you're very welcome, and Missy, thank you for um, already anticipating my thought. <laughs> that's what happens when with you work with people for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> kind of scary. Okay. Uh, we wrap this one up. Are we good with this for everybody? Any hands up? Hands up. I'm good. Uh, the moment. I, I, I'm good with it as long as uh, we, you know, make sure that we follow up on who's living uh, at that address just to make sure that we cover all the bases. Yes, um, Danielle is going to have to follow up on that, um, especially with Missy's findings that there is, in fact, two families living there and the way they know that is they went to the town hall and asked for um, documentation so that the kids could go to school start school today so there is in fact two families and i believe that when missy and i were talking today it was eight or nine people and that's an overload for that system so first of all it's a housing issue because of what we saw and then second of all it's it's taxing that septic system yeah, it's so a very. Dead, you know, go ahead. Sorry, it's Tom. Um, yeah, it's a very small system, two bedroom. I think it was like 200 square foot, uh, designed from 1981, thousand gallon tank. Um, but I just wanted to make one comment regarding the translation, um, so it doesn't become uh, something that slows down the process. The state does have um, headings. Um, that we can find in, in probably in at least seven languages, you know, including like Chinese and Portuguese and uh, French, Spanish, um, so on and so forth, that says this is an important notice, you know, to get it translated. So you can send it out that way. And then um, and then if you need to get another translator in right immediately afterwards. So at least they don't take a look at the letter and say, I, I don't know what this is and crumple it up and throw it away. Uh, at least I'll see, see that and then he can, uh, the, the individual can um, go to his, uh, you know, buddy who interprets things for him or his son or whoever it may be. Uh, so it's, it's just in bold, just an important notice. Uh, please get it translated. Very good. Thank you. Missy, could you take over for a minute? I have to step away for a minute. I'll be right back. Please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're welcome. So listening with everything that's going on as far as 106 Millville Street is concerned, and correct me if I'm wrong, Danielle is going to write us up a report on the different violations that she witnessed. Tom is going to do a draft letter uh, to be sent to the property owner and to 106 Millville Street um, certified mail for both once we get the you know the final draft done. Is that basically it in a nutshell? Alan, Tom? Well, um, uh, yes. so I was going to say to Alan's point about the housing, <clears throat> is there a, uh, in addition to the two points you just mentioned, Missy, with regard to um, the report and the letter, um, should we be taking an additional step with regard to the housing side of the situation? I would take into consideration any kind, whatever violations was witnessed by Danielle and your and yourselves, and whatever the codes were, whether it's the illegal restaurant, the housing issue. It seems to be that there's no real, you know, anything showing for the uh, a slaughterhouse. So I think whatever you guys witness that Danielle writes up as a violation of whatever codes the Board of Health is in charge of or gets their powers from, for lack of a better term, is what you guys should be doing. So I would agree that you would have you would should add something about housing. OK, thank you, Alan. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no problem. Um, I was wondering if it would be appropriate to um, if we have a uh, phone number for the owner of the property just to let uh, to, to use a phone or an email sort of alert as to what's going on and that documentation was going to follow. Um, just, I, just a thought. I can ask the assessor's office if they have any kind of a phone number, but typically, I mean, there's no business certificate, so there's no one to contact through that way, where if Ellen had something on file, because they were running a business. So I, I, I can also check with Gail because this gentleman did try pulling building permits, which I denied because of septic issues. So um, let me, I'm not, uh, unfortunately, I mean, unless you guys tell me otherwise, I was supposed to take tomorrow off to spend time with my daughter before she goes to college. So I wouldn't look into this until Tuesday because Monday's a holiday. Right. Um, I guess the only reason I was thinking about that on the property owner side of the situation um, was because of um, trying to get this done uh, as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, if it's going to be Tuesday, it's going to be Tuesday. And that's not an issue. I mean, you're entitled to time off. Um, I just, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing at straws trying to think of how to get this stopped and the appropriate people alerted as quickly as possible. Obviously, yeah. people put a lot of time into this yesterday, um, you know, trying to get it under control. Um, and I, I'm, I'm concerned about the people living in the house. It, it, it sounds pretty much like it's just the wild west. I mean, I, um, I, 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 I do have my laptop with me. I'm actually home tonight because of the weather and everything. But um, so I will check it occasionally because we do have an issue going on. So if I see reports from Danielle or if I see um, Tom has come up with a letter, I will definitely forward it off on to you guys. I, I don't want you to think that I'm not reachable or anything like that. I will check my emails just to make sure. Yeah, no, that's break fine, up. Missy, and, and I've I've never had an issue with reaching you at at all times, so that <laughs> that's fine. I just wanted to, um, like I said, I'm trying to think of how we can expedite the situation um, so that the property owner who 
is solely, you know, absolutely kind of at the end of the line is being responsible for what goes on on their property gets notified. And then, you know, the letter would follow in case that takes a little while. Um, I do like Tom Ryder's um, thought of, you know, using something from the state on the outside of the, uh, the notice so that, you know, it, even if it's not completely translated, there's no reason for this person not to bring it to somebody that can read it for them. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you. Breaker, breaker. I, I'm trying to raise my hand here. Um, so I, I looked up the owner online. Uh, so I have his address and I have a phone number too. I'm not sure how good the phone number is, but the address is, looks like it's a, uh, a real address. Um, so I can forward that over uh, to whoever, whoever needs it. I'm back. That would be great. I just reached out to Detective Erskine and he told him, I told him about the um, property owner and he said he would check into it. So um, if we have an actual address, I don't know. I'm sure he has access to finding it also. But if he needs it, I will certainly get that from you. Cool. It's funny you should mention you're at home, Missy, because I've got my kitchen door open. I'm sitting here at the kitchen table, and it is raining extremely hard. And I was thinking, I hope she's safe going home after the meeting. Thank God you're at home. <laughs> no, I, I saw the weather, and I'm like, I think I'll bring the laptop. I think this is one of those times I'll be working from home. <laughs> good. good. Good for you. Okay. Are we, we all set with this one? I think. All right. Yep. Next on agenda, Missy. So the next thing is um, uh, I uh, an update as far as flu clinics. Um, this is just going to take real quick. Um, I've been talking with Ann. Ann told me that she was supposed to meet with Oxbridge last um, last week or the no, I'm sorry, on Monday. Um, with Erin to talk about possibly having a four town flu clinic. It would be um, Menden, Hopedale, Northbridge, and Uxbridge, possibly utilizing the Mikulski School and having flu clinics th for three weeks on certain days. Um, she didn't say how many days, morning or night. Um, and she was supposed to get back to me. Uh, we would then, if that's what we're going to do, we would have to use colors instead of prep mod. Um, so I'm still waiting here back. Otherwise, um, and of course, wanted to know if you guys were all set with that idea. If not, we would just have to do um, our small clinics in, you know, this, she liked the idea of the school because there was, uh, but Miss Go again, because there was more space. So I didn't know might know how you guys felt about uh, doing a, a kind of a, a regional thing for flu clinics. The other thing too is on the DPH call yesterday because we're hearing about booster shots and where can they go. The state is not going to stand up the mass vaccination sites. Um, regional collaborators, you know, maybe, which is what we were, but they're really looking at um, see the, the pharmacies um, and physicians' offices to really be taking the lead on the um, booster shots. So with that, I turn it over to you, Andy. All righty, my thoughts on the VNA, the uh, regional uh, flu clinic in Oxbridge. I thought it was a good idea. Two different times a day for three days. It gives more opportunity for everyone to go as opposed to what we've been doing, senior center in our office. Um, I thought it was a good idea, my end. Tom, how do you feel, Pickner? Yeah, I agree. I had the opportunity to talk to Missy about it the other day and um, um, for the same reasons, it gives uh, more flexibility um, for folks to obtain the flu um, shot. Um, and I, I kind of like that regional approach. So. I'd be on board with the with that concept. Thank you, Alan. Um, I would uh, also be on board with that. I, I believe um, the uh, 
COVID clinic went really well. And, uh, I believe in trying to be a, a team player. Um, I think my only, uh, concern would be is maybe reaching out to the senior center to Amy to see if some sort of a shuttle might be available for our seniors. We do have the van. We do have a van driver. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, she would help us help the seniors get to the clinic that don't have other means of transportation. Um, that's it for me. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. That's a great idea again, Alan. Tease your bat in a thousand tonight. Not that you don't usually. I can reach out to Amy if you'd like. Yes, please. I don't, well, I don't know if it's necessary currently because we don't have a, a definitive yes or no that it's going to happen and an actual date or date. Yeah. But if you do, you, you say you do? I, I don't you have think? any dates. Ex I don't have any dates except it would be sometime in October. Um, but I can just okay. give Amy the heads up so that she, you know, she can at least stop maybe yeah. thinking about it. Yep. Cool. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. Another success story. Alrighty. Okay. The next thing is well, private well regulations. Tom Ryder, do you want to start off with this, please? Um, yes. So. I reached out to a couple of people that I, I know at the um, that either worked for DEP or are or, or still there. Um, what, one of the individuals says he's he, he's going to look through it um, to give his his feedback. Um, I haven't uh, I haven't heard back from the other person that I know. Um, so um, partly uh, they think it's a. Uh, great, uh, great idea to enforce the requirements for uh, testing every three years, uh, and to put it on the, uh, you know, ask the uh, Title V inspector to do so, or, or just um, or find a way to get somebody to, you know, forward uh, test results. It's just as long as it's not too onerous, where you, you're requiring like, um, you know, metals and volatiles and pesticides and you know so just make it like a, a reasonable amount that stuff that you typically see uh he says that some some towns require like testing for foaming agents and he says i've never seen it happen in 30 years uh, so he thinks that's kind of overboard but you know the typical you know the title five scan and you know for bacteria and nitrogens um, and even volatiles um are, are a good idea. So he's going to take a look at it a little bit more. Um, as far as um, as, far, as far as the comments uh, on the um, you know for you know for, for the other uh, for the other changes, I haven't heard heard anything back yet. Um, do you guys? Anyone have, have take a look at the? Uh, uh, the redlined document. I hope, hopefully, I sent it over uh, last last time. Uh, you know, changing. Uh, I think I changed over a little bit of section two, a little bit of section three, and I think we were working on section five, which is well location requirements. Um, I think we had uh, we were commented on stable and manure storage areas and how to how to kind of button that up. Andy, um, sorry. While I'm thinking of that, I did uh, talk to Max about that, and I told him that you guys would be looking into for his help into like for a definition for things like that, and he said he would be willing to help and would look into s some other wording in s um, other towns. Sorry. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the person who I talked to as well, the, their agreement regarding you know the deed notice of like secondary contaminant levels, um, notifying um, you know to the uh, the owners um, you know 
and then perhaps adding a like a third test. So first test. Uh, so for a new well, you'd first do the, you know for a new construction new well, you'd have the first test at the at the wellhead. Second test would be without treatment at the kitchen, and then say it comes back with you know volatile organic compounds in there. Uh, then they would need to put some sort of um, first decide whether you know they're going to have to redo their uh, well uh, <coughs> location or maybe they're going to treat it uh, so active use an activated carbon reverse osmosis or something um, and then uh, and then test it again after the treatment uh, see if that's taking care of the issue uh, so maybe maybe add uh, you know contingency third uh, not that you know that they wouldn't uh, <laughs> uh, think it's a good idea but just to put it in the in, in the regs to so that that they know it's going to be a requirement. Um, so that was the other comment that uh, he brought up. Andy, Tom Fisher has a question. Tom? Hey, Tom. Um, it just goes to the initial point when you were talking, and I, I may have missed it, when you were talking about what sounded like um, mandatory testing every three years. Did that's I in that the, correctly? Yeah, that's in the, uh, that's already in the, code in our code i i don't think we i don't think we've been really been enforcing it um uh, i think it's somewhat enforced um but uh i think you, you're the one who pointed it out to me so is that the, for uh, residential Tom? is that for a residential well uh yes um uh, that's a little bit strict isn't it that's it. That's in our. That was that was updated in the uh, last regulation change. Uh, a private well will have water sample collected and tested when transfer of title to the property occurs, unless the transfer occurred three years or less after the last sampling. Oh, oh okay. I, I thought you meant Joe resident had to do his every three years, like oh, myself. Okay. Yeah. No. No. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm talking oh, about yeah, transfer. I'm sorry. I, okay. did right, thank you. I, I did misspeak. I apologize for that. I uh, what I meant was uh transfer of title three three years uh um okay, after okay. the last transfer uh you know after uh, as a transfer of title if they hadn't sampled within three years. Right. Sorry about that. Miss oh, okay, thank you. Um, no, that that was my uh that's that was the clarification I was looking for because I was miss uh it sounded like there was a, a requirement there to have to the residents test their well every every three years. Okay, yes. thanks for clarifying. Okay, good. All right, got that handled. <laughs> All right, next case solved. All right. I was panicking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I'm not in compliance. I can tell you that. <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> I, I think there should be a suggestion that you know that. Uh, homeowners do sample for at least uh, coliform bacteria every springtime, just, uh, just, but not not a requirement. Just, uh, or maybe just put together. Um, actually, the state does have wonderful uh, guide guidance for homeowners that you know when we we put up a new when they when we drill have uh, excuse me when we permit a new well, you know we can attach like the guidance like uh, you know you should be testing for coliform bacteria every spring and. If you notice any issues, uh, you know, you know, just keep you know maintain your well. So, uh, I like that idea of providing information like that for someone, especially getting a new well. I think that's a nice, uh, nice educational tool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I haven't uh, I haven't moved any further than that uh, on this. Um, so I don't know if you guys had any more, um, any comments before I, I start, uh, asking around a little bit, uh, a little bit more about uh, closely looking at some of the requirements. I know we were talking about, um, what a semi public water supply is and whether, uh, whether that's going to be a, you know, like for a condominium association, uh, association, 
uh, that they need to maintain that water supply and whether it's going to be allowed to have one well or multiple wells. Uh, and this, is there any ability to um, uh, vary the requirements on that or, or whether it's an individual well per unit? Um, I mentioned that to the uh, to one of the two two people because I haven't spoke to the second person yet, and they weren't really in favor of that. Um, but I I asked them, can you give me some more information <laughs> before you just say you're not in favor? Just let me know. Um, so I think that's something to look at. You know, basically what we're trying to solve uh, as far as uh, uh, the allowance of of hump, you know how many wells per per uh, association tom thickner has his hand up again yeah I'll, I'll i'll tell you um i did have uh just just one thought and i, I know we briefly had touched on it with regard to what's currently in place um in the well regulations it's um under the section of water sampling procedure 5.5 uh, and in particular what we have written for uh, the item number eight um, when we talk about you know a private well will have a water sample collected and tested you know when a transfer of title to the property occurs unless the transfer occurs three years or less after the last sampling and testing so that that's what we clarified the second yeah. part there talks about uh, what the parameters are to be tested, uh, basic screen and, and total coliform, um, except that the board may require testing and other parameters at their discretion. I'm just wondering if there's a consideration for um, modifying that or, you know, a lot of it may have to do with the nature of where we are geographically and the, the things that we run into in the area that we live that may or may not warrant um, parameters, certain parameters being tested beyond the basic screen. I mean, I'll, I'll defer, Tom, to your expertise. I just throw it out there as a, as a thought. Um, yeah, so basic screen um, is, um, you know, includes like alkalinity, nitrogen, um, and it's stuff that the laboratories are all set up for. So it's a very it's it's a uh, somewhat comprehensive test that you know it it doesn't give you like all the um, uh, you know primary concerns like you know like the cancer causing agents uh, you know volatiles organic compounds but it does include you know other stuff like nitrogens and stuff like and stuff that indicates that you know the septic system is too close to the well or there be as being influenced wastewater is being uh, influenced in that well. So that it's important for that. Um, now, as I'm typing here, my uh, <laughs> my uh, my Word document just uh, went blank. So <laughs> uh, I wasn't able to add that note. So if you could email email that uh, comment to me, that that'll be good. Uh, I just had to shut down the uh, my Word document because um, uh, it crashed on me. Um, but, you know, the basic scan should, should be um, something that a laboratory could come in and, and run the sample or the homeowner could do it themselves. So the laboratory with similar bottles, they can um, just do a quick sample and send it out. Uh, it's quick and easy. They don't have to worry about, um, you know, forcing water into small little test tubes that need to be airtight. Um, which is kind of a pain in the neck, and that, um, and and they're, you know, fairly inexpensive. So it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a good protocol. Uh, it'll okay. give them a good basic background. Um, okay, so so it sounds like the word, even though I'm seeing the word basic, it does sound like this basic screen, as we're phrasing it, uh, is rather uh, involved in terms of various components that it it does look for. So it sounds like maybe it is some, you know, at the comprehensive, somewhat comprehensive in that it is, uh, the word basic kind of threw me a little bit. I just wondered uh, if it was enough of a screen, but it sounds like, you know, oh, basic oh, is screen it? Is, 
Oh, you go. Yeah. Oh, so you're going the other. You're going the other way where, where it might not be enough. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So like, it, it right. um, it it uh, like it will give you like conductivity of of the water, but what does it actually mean? Uh, so if if you if you look at the conductivity, um, it can just mean that there's um, you know, certain things that you got to watch out for. Uh, you know, if it's a ne uh, in the negative or the positive, you know, if you, if you're, if you, uh, you know, so it may not give you enough information, but it may tell you there's something there that you need to co continue looking for, uh, or it could just, or it could be nothing. <laughs> so, so it does give you, sometimes it leads you to more questions than, than answers. Um, uh, yeah, we can look to see, um, you know, I, I, you know, I know Hawkinson had, I, I think went the completely other direction at one time where they had so much to sample for. I think it was, um, why are we sampling for cadmium? You know, we're not near a landfill. Um, you know, uh, yeah, volatile cannabis compounds are good, but are they, do you need them every three years or maybe it should be like every, you know, eight years? Um, uh, but if yeah. if you see volatile organic compounds uh, in a prior sample, then yeah, now you got to monitor. You should be monitoring it. So uh, yeah, so I'll I'll look at that. I'll you know I'll take a look at a, um, you know one of these uh, laboratories, Microbac or Alpha Analytical, whatever. You know, just kind of put together a list. You know, what, you know, basically, if there's a kind of like a plug and chug. Uh, screening that they, you know, they offer uh, that kind of fills all the uh, information that I think that we we need, especially because you know this whole town is septic and well, uh, you know, in, in some cases uh, farm animals, I guess. Um, make sure that uh, we're we're uh, cornering the areas uh, that need to be addressed. Um, you know, yeah. if it's near, near an old factory, yeah. uh, like uh, that was if, kind of the idea that I had, just with regard to what our environment is within our community, within our town, what we face, say versus another community that geographically is structured differently in terms of you know the environment. So, right, um, if you're in the arsenic yeah. belt, uh, arsenic belt, then yeah, you should be sampling for arsenic. Uh, <laughs> At least, uh, you know, at least a few first uh, few rounds to make sure you're not drawing up any arsenic. Um, so, um, okay, yeah, I'll I'll put that on my uh, thing to do to see if I can get some basic, uh, uh, comprehensive and basic scans that that uh, that laboratories offer uh, to see if it fits. Are there any known areas of town that we we know of? Um, and maybe we can look at this through the mass DP, mass DP as a tool regarding uh, known uh, 21E sites that require uh, 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 phase two studies uh, to you know to uh, check out plumes of contaminants. If we if we know any of those, maybe we can say, aha, there's you know there's a few wells here that they need to address uh, sample. Uh, if they drill, so um, okay. I, actually, I could, I could, I could do that. I could probably pull up a map and and send it over too. It's just so see what we're looking at as well. Uh, okay. Any, awesome. any, um, any, any more thoughts? Uh, I, I just want to make sure that we. Uh, Keep moving forward and, and actually address the concerns that we have uh, to bring this up to speed. I'm good. I'm the on board. Only other, uh, the only other one thing I would just throw out as a as a thought as I was reviewing the what we currently have in place is the uh, we do have a section uh, eight dot for penalties currently um yeah. and i didn't i was looking to see i don't know if that's been if there's been a suggested modification of or if we would run with it as currently 
stated, um, the question I just had for myself was, as it's currently written, um, is this is it written sufficiently to have what I would call bite? I'll just throw that out there as a thought. Yeah, there, there may be other uh, penalties. Um, you know, um, the board determines that, you know, it maybe uh, fines are not important to them. Uh, well, maybe uh, prohibiting uh, activities uh, that the board has jurisdiction over uh, for permitting, that could be another penalty. Uh, you know, uh, uh, suspension or or uh, removal of their licenses uh, that the board health uh, has jurisdiction over. Uh, that's another penalty uh, that probably could be added to it. Because, uh, you know, are we going to go to court for $10? Um, well, you keep adding adding up ten dollars a day. Uh, eventually, it's worth worthy of going to court, uh, and uh, and it might scare them a little bit. Uh, but you know, the first uh, first look at ten dollars. Uh, <laughs> you know. Correct. Yeah. Understood. Yep. Okay. Um, but but like for a uh, say for a um, you know inspector or or you know installer or whoever uh who, who violates uh hey you could lose your license or suspend your license that, that might motivate them a little bit quicker yeah yeah agreed okay thanks okay what's next missy the uh the only other thing that i have is a, a consistent thing is a uh the dumpster regulations i don't know what direction you guys want to go with that um tom wasn't here last week just let's just try and recap to the best of our abilities tom some of the some of the ideas we came up with were um, line of sight in placement of a dumpster for uh, traveling on roads they can't be too close to the roads the, the planning board has a, a, um, a bylaw of a minimum of 20 feet for any structure uh, off the edge of the property line I think we should mimic something like that. Um, Alan, can you remember some of the things that we talked about? Maybe Missy has notes just to bring Tom Fickner up to speed on what we were discussing last week. Uh, yeah, I believe some of the things were like um, the company name on the dumpster. Um, we were talking about whether or not to require um, covering uh, to keep rainwater, et cetera, uh, out of the dumpster. Um, we were talking about uh, a little bit about, you know, switching the dumpsters out, how long the dumpster could be there um, to try to make sure that, you know, the dumpster was being switched out um, properly. Uh, a fee for a permit the permit would be a temporary with a time limit like you just stated a time limit on a permit as to how long you can have a commercial dumpster in a residence go ahead alan sorry uh that's okay and weren't we talking about um putting general trash like household garbage in the dumpster i don't remember the details of that, but obviously that, um, I believe um, Mike said that he didn't know of any restrictions, um, but we, we were trying to think of a way of uh, keeping uh, general trash out of that temporary dumpster. Andy, Tom that, Ryder has put his hand up. Okay, that's gonna be a hard one to enforce. I'm not going dumpster diving to see if people are throwing their, their kitchen trash in a dumpster. Um, again, it's, it's, not, it's not desirable. It's not a good thing. Uh, go ahead, Tom Ryder. Sorry about that. Uh, is it okay? Uh, do you guys still need me? I, I'm jumping on to another meeting uh, in my hometown right now. Thank you very much for joining us, Tom. As usual, you're a wealth of knowledge and we appreciate you. 
All right. Thank you, guys. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, right. Tom. Thanks, Tom. So, Missy, do you have anything to remember from last week's meeting that we can bring Tom Fickner up to speed about uh, subjects that we started discussing as to potential um, rules and regulations for dumpsters? Uh, I, I think those are ba the basics. I think it's really just trying to figure out what exactly, what type of regulation you want to create. Um, is it, you know, and what towns that have already created these regulations. I think I sent you guys copies of Upton. I think it was was Spoilston and a one other town. Might have been Millville that have dumpster uh, North regulations. Bridge is one of them. Northbridge. Um, yeah. Just to give you guys an idea of what other towns have done and and just really to try to figure out what are you trying to accomplish and how are you going to accomplish it? What do you, do you really want in these regulations? That's all I can think like of. Andrew. My question is enforcement. I mean, we can make these regulations and charge fees and, <clears throat> excuse me, have permits. My question is enforcement. If a neighbor is complaining about a dumpster, which is, is their right, who's going to go out there and, and enforce this? The zoning officer? The cops? They're going to say, that's your regulation. That's my and first thought. They would be right. It is your regulation whether it's a, your health agent, a board member, or whoever you designate. The only thing it will Lenny's help, that. well, maybe when we get this other person for the eight towns, maybe that person, since, you know, some of these regulations I've sent off to you guys, it, it's going to be working for these towns. Um, but yeah, it's going to be under the Board of Health, so you've got to figure out how you would do your enforcement. And when someone calls and complains about a dumpster now maybe you have a little bit more teeth compared to right now you have nothing right that's my only my only thinking is when you have someone complaining in a residential area someone's doing construction someone is doing running a business and they've got a 20 30 yard dumpster that only gets you know cleaned out once a month now you have teeth as far as a regulation. And Tom Fickner has a question. Oh, I can just say Tom now. Yeah, just one Tom on board. <laughs> um, well, just to um, support what Missy had just said uh, and to your question, Andy, about enforcement. Um, so you're, you're right, Andy, in that, you know, um, we as individuals aren't, aren't about to go out and start dumpster diving. However, to Missy's point, if there's nothing in writing anywhere, then there's no basis for any kind of enforcement or any kind of a guideline that, um, let's say, there are people that want to follow the rules will follow in terms of utilization of a dumpster. You know, I, I mean? get that. I get that. I was just um, taking somebody else's role, playing devil's advocate, and um, just trying to. I'm certainly all for the regulations with what you just said. It's like a locked door or an unlocked door. I don't know. It'll keep the honest people out. Um, so it'll keep the honest people complying. But we're going to have the ones that are going to thumb their nose at us. So that's my only concern. Um, just a, a future thought. You know, I'm certainly all for starting regulations because, as, as we've stated, we have nothing. Well, you played the DA role very nicely. Um, and I was Double is in the at details. That, well, that's it. And, you know, as Missy said, you know, whether it be this new individual in this role with this regional position or, you know, uh, health agent or somebody within our group, um, it would be, if we created these regulations, it would be the onus would fall upon you know, the Board of Health, you know, to follow through. Um, I was noticing in the, you know, the Northbridge Board of Health regs for dumpsters, they actually do specifically have as one of their guidelines uh, that there shall be no commingling of household waste with what they're calling C and D waste. So you're right, though, in terms of enforcement, that's probably going to come down to a case where we'd be following up on a complaint where somebody is seeing something that doesn't seem right. 
So as we normally do, um, we, you know, we'll, in follow-up is where we would come across visually confirming what is being, um, you know, is what is being presented and hopefully can, it's just a matter of simply correcting the behavior, you know, should it come across. But um, again, I, I'm not a proponent in general of over-regulation. Um, and sometimes all it takes is one or two to force regulation of any kind because, you know, it, that's, that's unfortunately how a lot of regulations get made. So I'm for doing it in a fair manner. Um, but uh, I think of it in terms of guidelines, what I would call responsible guidelines on using a dumpster as opposed to regulation may sound kind of harsh as a word, but think of it in terms of um, best practices for utilizing a dumpster when the need arises. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. So I've got one for you. Just a thought, and I, I, I already know the answer, but I'm going to throw it out there. If, in fact, we do have regulations or guidelines in place with a need for a, a fee permit, a permit with a fee, and some things that you should follow, guidelines you should follow, and somebody complains that they are commingling, and we find out that, in fact, they really are, can we forbid, and this would be a comment for counsel, not that, again, like you said, Tom, because I'm the same as you, you really don't want to be the Gestapo here, but can you forbid someone because you didn't play by the rules? So, no, you can't have a, a, a commercial dumpster in your residence. What do you think about that? Probably not. I, I get it, but I'm just throwing it out there. Well, um I think uh, in, in the absence of any guidelines or regulations, let's say, because that's what this would actually become, in the absence of that, there there is zero possibility to restrict the usage. Um, sure. And, and deny somebody the ability to do it. At least if we have regulations in place, um, it gives something of the ability to defined for the folks on how they need to utilize the dumpster in a, you know, in a, in a healthy, respectful manner without, you know, without abusing, you know, the, the privilege that's being provided with the regulation. But if you're going to much like a, a license, you're given a license by the state, if you abuse the, the roadways uh, enough, you get your license taken away. So that's potentially something that could be part of the regulation um, whereby we could deny the ability for the resident to uh, utilize a dumpster if it's being utilized improperly. Andy? All right. Alan, you got anything for this? Uh, I think along uh, Tom's lines, um, just the general information provided with the permit on the proper use of the dumpster um, just may, may help the homeowner or the contractor use the dumpster properly um, and prevent any issues. Um, and even if a homeowner were to throw a couple bags of, you know, household trash in the dumpster, if the dumpster isn't there for a long period of time or if the dumpster has a cover on it, it's probably going to prevent any issues because if it has a cover on it, things are less apt to blow out. If it's emptied on a regular basis for the period of time that it's there, the stuff isn't going to sit there too long. So I, I think in general, some of these guidelines uh may help prevent complaints and prevent issues um just like you mentioned sight line 20 feet so you know hopefully that won't it won't be you know uh offensive to uh, a neighbor where the dumpster is placed um so i i think some of this just by enacting these guidelines, or if we want to use the stronger word, regulations, um, I, I'm hoping I'll play my role. 
I'm hopeful that some of this will take care of itself. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. I'm good as far as everybody else is. I think we've all said it pretty much over and again, over and over again, the, pretty much the same thing. So I, I think that uh, I, I'm not ready to make a to formulate, unless you guys are, to formulate a structured regulation at this time. It, I, what do you guys think? Andy, I'm sorry, well, you broke up on that last statement. Uh, you said you weren't ready for what now? To formulate a regulation at this time, I, I think we've got some. We've we've talked it over a couple of times. You you missed last night's last week's meeting, but two weeks ago, and we just brought you up to speed as to what our conversations were. And uh, do you feel that something should be starting to be written up, or do you want more time to think about it? What do you What do you guys think of that, Tom? Well, I, I believe we we should we should craft something. I, I believe there should be something in existence uh, that does define um, define the usage. Um, okay. Yeah, that would be my thought. Get on it, will you? All right. Right after that draft letter, <laughs> I'm going to work on. <laughs> okay. All righty. Okay. So my question to you guys would be, did you, out of the regulations I have sent you, is there any towns that you're leaning towards that would more fit Menden that we could start working with? Or do you want to look over them a little longer and talk about it at the next meeting? Tom Fickner, ha Tom has his hand up. Um, well, I have reviewed a couple of them. So I, I think um, these references, Missy, that you provided are good, uh, good core bases uh, for, um, you know, creating, starting the process for creating a draft. Um, and of course, we just have, I mean, these are similar communities to, to Menden. Um, and I, I think um, this, there's a good starting point here with the information we have. It's just going to be a matter of, it'll take a little time because we're going to have to maybe pull pull from one, maybe pull from another, we want, you know, to craft something that, you know, meets what, you know, we think is appropriate for Menden. Um, and it just be, it's going to be a little process. Um, but I think we have some good starting information to, you know, to, to start with. Can I make a recommendation to you guys? Absolutely. Sure. I would say maybe um, have the have a target date of January 1st, 2022 as a date to have these regulations ready to go forward with. That way, I think that gives you plenty of time because other things come up like, you know, 106 Millville came out of the blue. So we're going to be concentrating on that. Um, and I think it just gives you more time to figure out what you want to do. It's a good starting point with the new year, and I think it's a reasonable amount of time, but that's totally up to you guys. But that just just off the top of my head, a suggestion. Andy? I nominate Missy for chairman. Nope. <laughs> it doesn't pay You're enough. Uh, <laughs> chair, wo chair woman, AJ. Chair woman. I know. Pol politically correct, eh? But think of all the perks right. that you get, Missy. I'm good. You know, for example, what, what happened to me yesterday when I was at 106 Millville, um, when I left the premises, um, I, I had a hitchhiker that came on board in my vehicle. Now, I, here I am. I'm driving a, a convertible, and the top was down. So it was nice for a little while while the top was down, but when I eventually put my top up, I still had a, um, a hitchhiker. And actually, even through today, I still have a little hitchhiker in my vehicle that refuses to leave. <laughs> and by hitchhiker, I'm referring to a, um, a couple of fly insects. Must be something that's attractive. Resident, resident, attractive. <laughs> resident from the farm. Yep. 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 All right. I agree with Missy on the April. Uh, yeah, April 1st. <laughs> January 1st. Dead. Dead, let's shoot for January 1st to have these in place, start of a new year, start of a new regulation. And uh, next week we will, after reading the uh, other towns, 
we will start a bullet point um, things of, that we would want, and we will start structuring starting next meeting. When is the next meeting, Missy? Well, that, I was just looking at the calendar, and there are four Wednesdays in September. To actually, a total of five starting tonight. So I don't know if you want to do two meet, you know, a total of three meetings in September. Um, but right now, you would look at September fifteenth as your next meeting. Certainly, we don't want to go any further than that with with the um, Millville Road going on. Um, let let's schedule at least that one. Okay. What? Um, so, for as far as a plan is concerned, maybe uh, we'll get Danielle's um, report. Oh, I didn't Thomas. tell you. I'm sorry. She did text me back. She said uh, she apologizes for missing the meeting, and she will send over the report tomorrow. Okay. So then okay. um, once we get the report, send it off to Tom, Tom Fickner, uh, figure out how to, you know, put a, a letter together, send it out to you guys. If you guys feel that you need to have another meeting, we can always have a quick meeting next Thursday. Uh, okay. Yeah, because Tuesday, Monday's a holiday. You have to have 48 hours notice to post. So, you know, we've got the, I, you know, we got wiggle room. I think that um, certainly by emails, and if, if it's sent to me and I can't open it, I can come in and see you, and we can yep. get this out um, prior to having a meeting. Okay, sounds good to me. If everybody's on board with that, that's the direction we will go. Thank you. Well, Alan Greenberg, do you have anything else? No, uh, I'm on board with everything, and I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Tom Fickner. Uh, just before I second, just a quick question on that uh, draft letter. I don't know if you all had a chance to look at um, uh, it was the one that had to do with our residential uh, kitchens. If you gentlemen had a chance to look at what I had presented to Missy earlier today. I did not. Was there much change from um, what we had? A, a little bit. I had put a little bit more um, uh, verbiage that was crafted around the compliance element and um, whatnot. I know Missy was looking to try to do something uh, today, but she's out tomorrow. It, it's something I guess that could, you know, could go out for, for Monday. Well, Monday's a holiday. Oh, actually, actually, I'm glad you Tom, brought that, that up because. Hang on one second, please, uh, Alan. Um, you had mentioned by text today that you would like to go to those addresses, and I simply asked. Let's talk about it tonight. I'm certainly all for it. If you have interest in, in, in going to meet these people and discussing it with them, that's fine. I just wanted to see if there was anything that we needed to bring up about that. Um, the one comment I made about the first letter was just a thought where it says that the um, residential kitchen license will expire on December 31st. My thought was that maybe around that area of the letter there should be something stating that it has to be it's 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 renewable every year and has to be renewed january 1st or it should say that the somewhere between january 1st and, th and december 31st that's what the time frame is just some to, so that they don't think it's a one and done type thing yep actually Alan, uh, that was part of my rewrite um i put in a little statement there next to uh, permit fee to kind of, I think that highlights your concern, Andy, or addresses uh, the verbiage so that people don't realize it's just a one and done, that it is an annual reoccurring fee that they'd have to do. So that, that was part of the, um, the draft that I put through. Okay. Um, Alan, I'm sorry, but go ahead. It's your turn. No, nope, that's fine. Uh, Tom, was that the one that you sent out uh, and it was all in red? Yes, what was in red was the uh, that would be the text of the letter, Alan. Correct. Yep, yep. I, I'm I'm in agreement. I, I I had the opportunity to review that and uh, liked it very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm good with it. I'm reading it right now. Oh yeah, this is a recurring annual fee of permits expire annually on December 31st. Okay. All in favor of sending this letter out when Missy comes in for overtime tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aye. Uh, Aye. 
Aye. <laughs> right. Cool. Thank you, Tom. He okay. meant Tuesday morning. Yeah, Tuesday yeah, that's morning. what I meant. <laughs> All right, so we'll see you on the 15th. Very All right, good. So I Tom, second that motion. <laughs> okay, very good. That's what I needed. All righty, so I'll see, I'll see you all on September 15th or listen to you all on September 15th. There you go. Thank hey, you. Enjoy your, enjoy your ladies' uh, day out tomorrow, Miss. I will. Thank you. Yes, Take right. care. Good night. Good night, guys.